So, um, hello, Peter, and hello, we told. I'm very glad to see you here in St. Petersburg, but not uh, exactly here in St. Petersburg, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, in video uh, translation. And uh, um, so today we have the presentation of the last issue of our journal, Horizon Studies in Phenomenology. And uh, I'm, should like to, I would like to thank you very much for deciding to participate in our uh, presentation. And a few words about this special issue. Um, so, uh, the special issue titled Traditions and Perspectives of the Phenological Movement in Central and Eastern Europe. And last year, in June, uh, in the Institute of Philosophy of the Research Center for the Humanities of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, was held a conference titled uh, Horizons Beyond Borders, Traditions and Perspectives of the Phenological Movement in Central and Eastern Europe. And Peter Andras Varga and Vitold Plotka were the organizers of this conference. So the main idea uh, of the conference was to explore the place of phenomenology in contemporary philosophy in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so we know it, it has long been understood that the circumstances of their phenological movement in this part of the world were dramatically defined by the politics of the times. The generally hostile conditions for doing philosophy affected phenomenologists uh, specifically insofar as it was officially regarded as an idealistic bourgeois and regressive philosophy. And also we know that many philosophers of that time were completely isolated and phenomenology in this part of Europe, I mean the central and eastern part of Europe, has developed in a steady dialogue beyond national borders and ideological boundaries. So it was also in Russia. But now we know such leading figures of the phenological movement as um, Alexandra Dragomir, Roman and Garden, uh, Josef Tischner, Karl Wojtyla, and many, many others about them we will speak today. Um, so the full potential of the phenomenology constitutes a rich heritage that continues to define our contemporary philosophical horizons. The aim of the conference was to present scholars with a uh, first time opportunity to discuss the wide and rich range of phenomenological ideas that have been discovered in Central and Eastern Europe. And after the conference, we have decided to prepare this thematic issue of our journal, Horizon Studies in Phenomenology, uh, based on the conference proceedings. So here is the result. Um, and I should also say that the first presentation of this issue was in Gdansk two months ago. It was a conference, uh, the second conference, Phenomenology and Practice, uh, the second conference on traditions and perspectives of the phenomenological movement in Central and Eastern Europe, and we told Plotka organized this uh, conference. And there, so I would like to thank the told especially for the first presentation of this special issue in Gdansk two months ago. And it was a really very nice and uh, inspiring meeting. And so uh, today in St. Petersburg, it is the second presentation of the special issue. So once again, the first was in Gdansk. And once again, thank you to the told for this opportunity. And uh, so you see that, so the first conference uh, um, dedicated to the phenology, phenological movement in Central and Eastern Europe was last year in Budapest and this year in Gdansk. And perhaps we told yeah, next year it will help hopefully. in, hopefully, yes, in Riga. So it will be continued. Uh, I should say that uh, in Budapest it was a very large scale conference, so more than 60 participants, yes from different parts of the world, not only from the Central and Eastern Europe, but from different parts of the world. Um, and it was a really an exciting meeting. I know how it is difficult to organize a, a good conference and uh, so how much effort it takes. And the conference was perfect. And in Budapest and Gdansk also. So many thanks to once again to Peter and Vitold. And uh, um, uh, while preparing this uh, thematic issue, um, we were in contact with Peter and Vitold because Peter and Vitold are the co-editors of this special issue. And I would like to express uh, my thanks uh, to our co-editors, uh, to Vitold and Peter once again. It was really a pleasure for me as well as for our editorial board to cooperate with them and uh, 
to make this, uh, to prepare this special issue, and it was really a cooperation in a very friendly uh, and professional manner. So I'm very much looking uh, forward to continue our cooperation. And now, uh, so once again, thank you for deciding to participate in our online event. And I uh, think we can uh, open our presentation with the first paper. And I give Witold the floor. So Witold, please, you will be the first, if you are not against <laughs> this <laughs> order. So you will be the first. At all, please. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Natalia, uh, for this introduction. And uh, uh, let me say only a few words about uh, the publication. Uh, it was indeed a great pleasure and honor to be a co editor with uh, Peter uh, of this special issue. I think it's very important to promote uh, central and Eastern European phenomenology. And I hope that we'll organize also this uh, third conference. And of course, I want to thank you, Natalia, for, for, for uh, great work, uh, for your support and for the publication of this volume. And as you can see, uh, uh, my paper is uh, connected uh, uh, to, to, to uh, Central European phenomenology. I will I give a short talk on early phenomenology in Poland. I want to indicate my trends, problems, and key figures. So, introduction. Phenomenology in Poland has a long tradition. This fact has been, highlight, has been highlighted by the recent publication of two important books. Here you can have uh, uh, the, the, the um, front covers of the books. Uh, namely, a uh, bibliography of Polish works related to Husserl um, and a collection of selected articles connected to or using phenomenology and published in the pre war period. Both works show that the very first fi Polish thinker uh, to refer to Husserl was Władysław Hynek who already published his review of his Philosophie der Arithmetik in German in 1895. In turn, the first text on Husserl in Polish was published in uh, 1904 by Łukasiewicz, a prominent member of the Lwów Warsaw School. These basic facts are, however, not very well known. Even more, the contributions of early Polish Phenomenology too, and its influence on contemporary philosophy has been remained under uh, has been remained un rather unexplored, and they are usually reduced uh, to Roman's Roman in Gardens philosophy. This paper aims to provide an introduction to the context, main figures, and text of the phenomenological movement in Poland in the period of 1895-1945. Uh, uh, by, by this uh, period, I understand early phenomenology uh, in Poland. Uh, in doing so, the paper uh, also attempts to present the main trends of early uh, Polish phenomenology and on this basis to formulate a diagnosis of the pre-war phenomenological movement in Poland. A further aim of this paper is to give a description of phenomenology in Poland as a pluralistic movement that can, of course, be regarded as having centers, for example, figures such as in garden, but also peripheries, which deepen our understanding of what phenomenology was and can be. The phenomenon of phenomenology in Poland is indeed rich and complex. It was shaped in and through a lively dialogue, and this included a critical con confrontation with the lvov warsaw School. At the same time, the scope of phenomenology in Poland is irreducible to academic philosophy or to the single discipline of philosophy. To the contrary, phenomenology has also been pre present even prominent in artistic, psychological and sociological circles. Even more, 
due to his historical circumstances, phenomenology was engaged in political context. Thus, the question of phenomenology in Poland is a question of different areas of interest, periods, topics, and focuses. The first part of my paper, first reactions, 1895-1918. Uh, Although Husserl's early work, Philosophie de Arithmetique, uh, published in 1891, is usually regarded as a pre phenomenological work that develops an account of the concept of number based mainly and mostly on descriptive psychology. It does contain some ideas that led to the laying of a foundation of a major form of phenomenology. Reacting constructively to criticism, soon resolved to overcome the psychological psychologism of this work. In this connection, his Logische Untersuchungen seems to be a breakthrough work, because here Husserl formulated the main arguments against psychologism in logic and laid a methodological basis for Fenlodge. This widely discussed work made its author famous, and it opened for him the path to a professional position at the University of Göttingen. In Poland, both works of Husserl aroused serious, ser serious academic interest. Heinrich. Heinrich published his critical and polemical re review of Husserl's Phil Philosophie der Arithmetik in the Fiertel's Reichschrift für uh, Wissenschaftliche Philosophie in 1895. Earlier, he had studied in Zurich and Munich and written his dissertation under uh, uh, Richard Avenarius. He wrote the review in Vienna. After his return uh, to Poland, he worked at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. In the review, Heinrich focused on methodological issues. In his view, one can investigate concepts in a twofold manner, namely, either by bringing their different layers of development to clear insight. He, he uses a uh, German phrase, klare Einsicht, into their value, value and scope, or by describing their present stage of development. There is no evidence that Husserl even took notice of Heinrich's review. Indeed, the second, sec, secondary literature pays more attention, much more attention, to Husserl's reaction to the famous review of Gottlob Frege. Although this seems, uh, it seems that uh, Heinrich did not influence him, it may not be an exaggeration to say that Husserl's early thought was shaped by another Pole, Kazimierz Twardowski. It is well known that Twardowski's influence on Polish philosophy is pervasive. He is commonly regarded as the founder of the Lwów Warsaw School of Logic. Like Husserl, Twardowski studied, in, uh, studied philosophy in Vienna under Franz Brentano. Unlike him, however, he completed his dissertation under, under Robert von Zimmermann. Twardowski influenced Husserl in regard to the theory of acts and, as a result, in regard to the critic of psychologism. In his early work, So Lehre von Inhalt und Gegenstand der Vorstellungen, Twardowski argues that an immanent phenomenon, such as a mental act, must be regarded as involving three elements, content, object, and presentation. The object is irreducible to the act, but the act refers to its object by virtue of its content. Husserl discussed this theory while working on the theory of intentional objects and his critique of psychologists, and moreover, he reviewed Fadowski's work. Fadowski had a so, so strong influence on phenomenology in Poland. For example, he encouraged his Lvov students, including in Garden, Bronisław Bandrowski. You, you can uh, read something more about uh, those students on the slide. 
Bronisław Bandrowski, Stefan Błachowski and Kazimierz Ajdukiewicz to study philosophy in Göttingen. Another student of his, Stanisław Leśniewski, who is known for the construction of the three nested formal systems, regarded Husserl's philosophy as one of the sources of his own view of philosophy. Yet, it was Łukasiewicz, a student of Twardowski, a logician and an interpreter of Aristotle's syllogistic, who published the first work on Husserl in Polish. In a short note, he summarized Husserl's arguments against psychologism, pointing out that psychological laws are only probable, whereas logical laws are reliable. It is worth noting that the first Polish student of Husserl in Göttingen was Alexander Rosen Rosenblum Augustowski, who began his studies under, under Heinrich at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow in 1902. He moved to Göttingen in 1905, where he studied for 10 semesters. Rosenblum was a co-founder of the Göttinger Philosophische Gesellschaft in 1907. He participated in Husserl seminars, but also in, in, Hein, uh, in Reinach's classes. Rosenblum was interested mainly in the question of the phenomenological method. Later, he cooperated with the Munich Circle. In 1908, he presented in Reinach's seminar a talk on Łukasiewicz, Analysis and Constitution of the Concept. This was the title of the paper. In his correspondence, Husserl mentions Rosenblum a few times. Rosenblum was a very active member of the Göttingen and Munich circles, though he, he did not publish any text. By the way, uh, for this reason that uh, he was very active but he didn't publish anything, uh, he, for many people he is comparable to uh, Johannes Daubert, so Polish Johannes Daubert, so to speak. So, though the period uh, 1895-1918 was the beginning of the phenomenological movement in general, phenomenology resonated in Polish academic life in many respects. Ingarden reviewed the second edition of Husserl's Logical Investigations. Rosenblum attempted to translate the work, but he eventually abandoned the project. In addition, Konstanty Michalski and Joachim Metelman, you can read more on the slide about those two philosophers, refer to some elements uh, of Husserl's uh, theory of knowledge. During this period, Polish thinkers tried not only to define basic concepts and methods of phenomenology, or to establish first polemics, but also, and first of all, they try to use phenomenology as a methodological tool. At this point, phenomenology uh, encountered it, its first critic in Poland. One, it was accused of using difficult technical vocabulary and as a result of beginning a philosophy. Two, its critic of the sciences was regarded as misguided because sciences simply are successful. And three, finally, its arguments were judged inconclusive and lacking in, in impact of, on psychology. Thus, the first reactions to phenomenology in Poland encompasses not only, encompass not only uh, commentaries on many aspects of phenomenological philosophy, but also a constructive critic of it. The second part, of my talk, The Lwów Circle, 1919-1945. The second phase of the de development of phenomenology in Poland seems to have a central figure, namely Ingarden, and it's strong it is strong connected to, the, to his teaching activities at, at Lwów University. 
In Gondon earned his doctorate with a dissertation of Bergson under Husserl at the University of Freiburg in 1918. After World War I, he returned to Poland and already in 1919, he published an important two-part study entitled The Phenomenologist's AIDS. This pair of articles present uh, a comparative historical and systematic study of the main topics of phenomenology, including Husserl's earliest psychologism in his Philosophie der Arithmetik, the critic of psychologism in, ro in lo logic, the phenomenological requirement to limit analysis to direct experience, the description, uh, sorry, the descriptive manner of investigations, the a priori basis of the analysis of essences and a transcendental reformulation of phenomenology by the methodological method of reduction that omits the petitio principi problem. For Ingarden, the aims of the phenomenologists ultimately involve systematic and rigorous descriptions of the, of the different fields of object and, as a result, the formulation of a formal and material ontology. Though the two articles did not raise the realist idealist controversy directly, they include several pivotal issues that later defined in Garden's critic of Husserl. For example, the question of the ontological neutrality of the reduction. As is well known, in Garden changed transcendental phenomenology with uh, being a philosophy that leads toward metaphysical idealism. In any case, Ingarden uh, emerged as a key figure of this period, both as a proponent as a, and as a critic of phenomenology. After his return from Germany, Ingarden worked as a teacher in the secondary school in Torun and later uh, starting from uh, 1925 uh, on, as a docent uh, at Lvov University. Although Husserl uh, intercarded uh, on his behalf to help him obtain a full position in Lvov at that time, it was only in 1933 that Ingarden was given a chair. In the 20s, Ingarden attempted to translate Husserl's uh, logical investigations into Polish, but the project did not meet with a favorable response from publishers. In the 30s, Ingarden was already an internationally, internationally recognized scholar on the basis of his authorship uh, of the literary uh, work of art, Das Literarische Kunstwerk published in 1931. Involved by contrast, he felt uh, himself a solitary phenomenological researcher because logic was still the dominant discipline of philosophy. In spite of this circumstance, he eventually established a group of talented scholars and researchers who were not necessarily his direct students, which developed phenomenology in new directions. As a result, the Lvov circle of phenomenologists include psychologists, philosophers, and aestheticians. For example, Salomon Eagle, you can read more on the slide, uh, Walter Auerbacher, um, Tadeusz Witwicki, Zofia Lisa, uh, who published one of the first uh, analyses of uh, uh, the phenomenon of cinema, movie, and and the last one, Leopold Blaustein. It is worth noting that Blaustein is the author of the first monograph in Polish on Husserl's phenomenology, published in 1928. It was Husserl's theory of the act, content, and the object of the presentation. The book is a critical elaboration of Husserl's theory of act consciousness. Blaustein accepts Husserl's method of eidetic description, but he rejects the requirement that one reduces within phenomenological history of philosophy. 
Although he is critical of Husserl's method, he describes consciousness in terms of an international, international act that, following Husserl and Twardowski, contains both a presentational content and the object of a presentation. According to Blaustein, Husserl did not differentiate consistently between experience and experiencing, and for this reason he cannot distinguish an ex experience sensation from the act of sensation. As a result, experience data are reduced to immanent experiences, and thus to object to consciousness. In Ingarden's view, Blaustein is not clear enough on this, because Husserl did not indeed differentiate between experience data and aspects of Schattungen of objects. If that is the case, then Husserl also distinguished cons consistently between the objective and the subjective aspect, aspects of experience. The publication Uh, the publication uh, of Ingarden's Das Literarische Kunstwerk was the beginning of the reception of phenomenology and aesthetics, for example, Fistek, Kronsky, Blaustein, as well as in artistic circles. In this connection, Blaustein presented original but polemical studies on imaginative representations in art and on the cinema. In addition, the Polish avant-garde painter, writer, and philosopher Stanisław Ignacy Witkiewicz criticized Husserl's philosophy for being an abstract and static theory of consciousness. In his view, Husserl's major error was the reduction of the late body. The transcendental ego, he argued, is an ephemeral ghost. Let me pass over to, to the conclusion. Early phenomenology in Poland developed as a reaction to the first phenomenological works published in Germany. The reception of Husserl's philosophy began in 1895, but the Munich Circle was also a popular point of reference. Of course, the re reception was not passive but, but critical, and in turn, it influenced Husserl. Phenomenology in Poland flourished as a pluralistic field of research that encompassed many distinct but intertwined topics and disciplines. Polish phenomenologists discussed classical issues of phenomenology, such as the structure of the act of consciousness, the possibility of method of reduction, and the question of psychologism. So, um, in some epistemology. So here we can indicate Rosenblum, Metzelmann, uh, in Garden, Blaustein, and of course, uh, Wittkage. In this connection, one can identify multiple formulations of phenomenology as descriptive psychology or as a transcendental philosophy. Phenomenology was used uh, or discussed with regard to epistemology, ontology, so in Garden, Przemicka, Kronska, Kronski and Witkiewicz, logic and semantics, Aydukiewicz, Leśniewski, Fistek as well, aesthetics, in Garden, Fistek, Lisa, Blaustein, Kronski, and social philosophy, Znamirowski and uh, uh, Bautro. Uh, Znamirowski uh, developed Reiner's theory of uh, acts, social acts. In the end, however, early phenomenology in Poland seems to have been shaped by two leading thinkers, namely Twardowski and Ingarden. Although he, he was not a phenomenologist at all, Twardowski inspired and defined Polish phenomenology as focused on the question of psychologies and that of the relationship between act, content, and object. A direct but, but critical student of Husserl, Ingarden, merged and melded basic phenomenological terminology and Polish philosophical vocabulary and determined the later reception of phenomenology in Poland, as con con concentrated on the realist idealist controversy. Briefly, Ingarden taught phenomenology how to speak Polish. During the early period, however, there was no Polish, so to speak, Polish school of phenomenologists. 
parallel to, for instance, the Wolf Warsaw School. Yet, as this paper shows, I believe so, the collective contributions of the early Polish phenomenologists constitute an excellent adjustment of the invaluable heritage of Polish philosophy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Witold, for your very interesting paper. And now questions or reaction? Some, some questions? So uh, perhaps uh, from, uh, from me will be the first question, just very general question. Uh, what reaction met in Poland to the Husserl's uh, transcendental, so-called transcendental term? So in other words, uh, which reaction met Husserl's the first book of ideas? Because, for, for example, for the Russian phenomenology and for the history of Russian phenomenology, it was um, the start point, so to say. So the first uh, book of ideas and the first reaction was by Gustav Spett, as I told also during this conference in Gdansk in September. So uh, the question about uh, the reaction in Poland on this transcendental turn. Yeah. Thank you for this question. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, issue, to be honest. Uh, so, as I said uh, during the presentation, during my talk, uh, Polish phenomenologists were focused mainly on the logical investigations. And not only phenomenologists, uh, as Rosenblum and Ingarden, but also logicians, as, uh, for example, Leśniewski. Uh, Leśniewski even wanted to translate it into Polish uh, because it was regarded as one of the fundamental works, but later then he abandoned the project and he decided only to uh, 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 to support other efforts to translate this work. But Ideas One, this book, uh, I think it was completely absent. It was regarded as the idealistic turn uh, in Husserl, and for this reason, Mm, many philosophers simply uh, abandon justification of the term, of the idealistic term uh, in Husserl. So they simply, uh, I think they, they skip the book. Of course, in Gardner's reception, it's, it, it's important in this context because when he published uh, uh, the, the, the review of the, uh, of the logical investigations, the second volume, uh, excuse me, the second edition of the Logical Investigation, so published in the same year as uh, Ideas One, he refers to Ideas One as one of the um, possible ways going out from uh, the problematic uh, field of the Logical Investigations, namely towards a transcendental uh, sphere of investigations. But in this sense, in, in the review for, from uh, 1915, uh, transcendental term still is regarded as mainly epistemological term. But later, starting, uh, I don't know exactly the day, but it started uh, in the 20s, it was regarded as idealistic philosophy uh, in a sense of uh, metaphysical uh, philosophy in general. And uh, at the end of the 30s, there are many articles, uh, I didn't refer uh, to them, there are many articles uh, published in Polish uh, dedicated to Husserl that criticized uh, Husserl for falling into idealism, metaphysical idealism. So uh, uh, at the beginning, so starting from 1913, uh, only the second edition of the logical investigation was reviewed. And as far as I know, there was no review of uh, Ideas One. Nonetheless, uh, in Garden and another important author to whom I did know to refer, Władysław um, uh, Tatarkiewicz, they refer to Ideas One, but they did not criticize uh, at the death time. But starting from the 20s, and it was obvious in the 30s, Ideas One, uh, is uh, idealistic work. Uh, work. So for this reason, uh, one has to be uh, very su suspicious of uh, uh, the idealistic uh, 
the consequences of, of Husserl's argumentation. So, so it was complicated in, in one word. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for this detailed answer we told. One more question, perhaps, already? Okay, perhaps later uh, we can put uh, questions after the all reports. Thank you, we told once again for your very thank interesting you. paper. And now uh, I would like to give the floor to Peter. Peter? Thank you. Uh, and good afternoon. Uh, I think it started to show. Okay, thank you uh, again. And uh, so, first of all, I would like to say thank you for all the participants of the conference in summer 2015. Also, uh, to those who submitted their papers to the special issue of the Horizons Studies in Phenomenology. And last but not least, to Natalia Artenko personally, editor in chief of this journal, for putting together this excellent issue. And it was really a pleasure for me. Uh, to uh, work together with you uh, and with Vitor in this regard. Uh, and I hope that this uh, conference and this journal issue uh, could have contributed uh, to strengthen the cooperation between us uh, phenomenologists in this region. So the uh, it's just better uh, to speak this way. Uh, can you hear me better? Okay. So I was asked uh, to speak about a topic um, that was in the center of interest of the conference and also of the journal issue, namely writing the regional history of phenomenology in Central and Eastern Europe. And I will do it uh, from the point of view of my main research interest, namely that is early phenomenology and my regional affiliation that is Hungarian, in the hope of being able to contribute some insights to our shared discussion. So, uh, just a technical remark. Okay, so the slides are, are working, but you can also find my slides at the academia.edu uh, page. So, uh, first, um, I would like to delineate a notion of early phenomenology uh, that will be used during my presentation. Uh, it's a bit uh, different from the one used by Witold, maybe. Then I present two case studies uh, on the regional historiography of early phenomenology and try to draw some lessons uh, they could teach us in this regard. Um, and uh, finally, I would shortly speak about some other uh, functions of, the, of this, uh, which must be mentioned as well. And just one important uh, thing uh, to begin with. Uh, so, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this talk is a contribution or insights uh, based on ongoing research, uh, both my research project in early phenomenology and other research projects at our institute, which uh, aim at uh, creating uh, digital archives of the history of Hungarian philosophy. So this is not, a, these are insights or, or comments, suggestions, but it's not a systematic exposition of the history of uh, early phenomenology in Hungary. Uh, you can find one excellent uh, short uh, survey in an article by Professor Meze in the Encyclopedia of Phenomenology, uh, published by Kluwer. But um, so at the same time, I think there is still a lot of new work uh, to be done uh, on this subject. So this is why it's, uh, it's not a systematic exposition, but rather some uh, new results, uh, so to speak. Uh, so first, uh, early phenomenology, the way I understand it uh, is an uh, umbrella term for the school of Brentano, the Munich and Göttingen phases of the phenological movement, the early Freiburg phase of the phenological movement. So it means that for the present purposes, early phenology ends somewhere around the First World War, the, the, the years of crisis, 17, 18, 19, 20. So it was at least uh, radically transformed and, uh, by the time. Uh, and uh, just one uh, short uh, remark. Uh, so early phenology was not a creatio ex nihilo by Brentano, but rather, at least I believe, uh, it was deeply rooted in uh, both the 19th century German academic philosophy, the so-called Universitäts philosophy, uh, as well as Austrian philosophy of that time, which was merely Herbartianism, 
including uh, the transmission, the Herbartian transmission of old Samuel, uh, for example, by Robert Zimmerman. Um, okay. Um, and then, um, um, so from this point of view, there are already uh, some relevant aspects of early phenomenology. Namely, uh, early phenology itself was a, a process of cultural transmission between uh, the southern and the northern parts of the German language and cultural area. So it somehow moves from, uh, from Austria and, uh, and South Germany uh, to North. And from this point of view, um, at least from the point of view of the Hungarian story, we were uh, closely integrated to this uh, area because of the uh, Habsburg Empire, uh, what at the time was called Austria-Hungarian Empire and was a constitutional uh, uh, so connection between the two countries. Um, and uh, I think that uh, uh, the, uh, drawing a line around the, the end of the Great War is also uh, useful for the purposes of this uh, regional history because uh, all region was transformed drastically uh, by the end of the war. Uh, this is uh, obvious. So, uh, so from this point of view, then uh, the question arises, uh, did this geographical and cultural proximity led to a contact between Hungarian philosophers and the school of Brentano or Brentano himself. Uh, university studies abroad in the so-called peregrinatio is a well understood and much studied historical phenomenon and Vienna was a common destination given its geographical proximity and the aforementioned cultural ties. Some years ago, I did an Ohio study in Vienna looking for Hungarians studying at Grand Tunnel. To make a long story short, there were, of course, many Hungarian students of Grand Tunnel, but none of them made a high profile career in philosophy. Respectively, interesting figures simply missed Grand Tunnel due to contingent reasons. The most painful uh, missed opportunity, by the way, was that of uh, Bernard Alexander who would later become uh, an the most influential professor of philosophy around the turn of the century uh, in Hungary. Uh, he had studied in Vienna just before Brentano arrived in 1874. Alexander had close ties to the Herbartian professor Robert Zimmermann, uh, who in turn had been a personal disciple of Bozano earlier in Prague. And Alexander was really visiting the classes of Zimmermann and having conversations with him. And Zimmermann helped him uh, to publish his first uh, papers, for example, Vienna Dailies. Uh, but uh, then in 71, uh, Alexander became dissatisfied with what Austrian philosophy could offer to him and moved to Berlin. And this is a tragic episode insofar as in Berlin, he suddenly uh, became attracted to uh, neo-Kantianism uh, uh, so under the guidance of Benno Erdmann and, and uh, the big uh, professor uh, Friedrich Pausen. So uh, uh, one, could, one might say that had Alexander encountered Brentano in Vienna before moving to Berlin, he could easily have been attracted to early phenomenology instead. So this is a big historical counterfactual at the beginning of the Hungarian reception of, of uh, early phenomenology. Okay, and then, so obviously there was a reception, but it was one generation later, namely uh, it consisted uh, in mostly students of Alexander, younger students of Alexander, their network and the one who had the deepest contact with Brentano himself, it is less known, was Geza Revis. Uh, by the way, he was actually the son-in-law of Alexander and uh, you can see a photo of, of the daughter of Alexander. So Revis uh, first studied in Munich, Berlin and Göttingen and he obtained his doctoral degree in Göttingen but not under Husserl but under Georg Elias Müller. Um, 
When he went back to Hungary, however, uh, he developed a rich correspondence uh, with Brentano, which lasted uh, until the death of Brentano. It was, it's really a rich correspondence, but it's still not published. And, it's, uh, and um, Brentano even tried to secure a professorship to Reves either in Innsbruck or in uh, uh, Prague. Later, uh, Reves was more or less forced to, to leave the country in 20, and he became a professor of psychology in Amsterdam. Um, it's also an interesting to note, uh, from the point of uh, view of this uh, question of proximity, that uh, it was in Italy, rather than in the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, that Akos Pauler, uh, who later became the most influential interwar uh, teacher of philosophy, so Akos Pauler uh, met, encountered Brentano, both in the sense of uh, encountering Brentano's ideas at a, a psychological congress in uh, 1904, and in the sense of encountering uh, Brentano personally in 10. Florence. So uh, one uh, could say that cultural proximity does not automatically translate itself uh, into philosophical proximity. In other words, philosophy of, uh, the history of philosophy is not fully determined by, uh, sorry, it's not philosophy of history, but history of philosophy. So the history of philosophy is not fully determined by macro level cultural factors. First, so this may be one uh, observation. Uh, second, but, but rather we have some thing, uh, things like uh, counterfactuals and contingencies when we uh, try to write this story. And second, there is an important question which I think was already uh, somehow uh, mentioned by Wittold, namely the, the question of originality, originality, originality sorry. Um, uh, the quest for originality. Uh, in this regard, uh, it is worth to draw a comparison between two Hungarians uh, who had some interaction with Husserl, uh, namely Merkio Paladi and Eugen Enbari. So Paladi, uh, who is the, uh, probably uh, known to everyone who have ever uh, read uh, Husserl's uh, writings, uh, between the logical investigation and the uh, ideas one. Uh, because um, you find that, uh, so Paladi visited Germany uh, for three years after the war, uh, after the turn of the century, and he was already an established intellectual by them. And he published uh, two small books, uh, one of them uh, called the Der Streiter Psychologisten und Formalisten in the Modern and Logik, published in, in 1902, uh, was actually an attack on Husserl, uh, and at least the way Husserl understood it, Palladi was uh, accusing Husserl that Husserl uh, was uh, plagiarizing uh, Bolzano. And then uh, Husserl, one year uh, later, in 03, published a, a critic of uh, Palladi's book, which is a, a very uh, rich text in which Husserl uh, formulates the basic uh, tenets of, the of his logical investigations. And uh, if we look at the reaction, uh, contemporaneous German reactions to, uh, to this text by Husserl, then we find that uh, Real, Alois Real, wrote a letter to Husserl uh, saying that, uh, um, I, I'm glad, so it's, it's probably quite hard to translate into English or Hungarian, so, Frechheit des Ungarischen Strebers nach Gebühr, so was having quite a, a bad um, opinion of, uh, of uh, Palladi. In contrast, if we look at the, uh, the way Palladi is remembered in, uh, in Hungarian uh, historiography of uh, Hungarian philosophy, he was actually remembered as a creative mind being, uh, being the forerunner of logic's linguistic turn and having revolutionary ideas on space and time. So in contrast, uh, Eugen Enivari, uh, who studied uh, at Husserl in Göttingen in winter semester uh, nine, uh, 1909 10, after finishing his studies uh, in Budapest in 06. So, um, 
Eivari, by the time he arrived in Göttingen, has uh, published a series of Hungarian papers in phenomenology. Amongst them, he also published a defense of Husserl against Palagi, but unfortunately, these papers were in Hungarian. But he really wrote a lot. For example, in, uh, in 13, he wrote a book on Husserl in Hungarian, which is, I guess, quite um, early for a book uh, on monograph dedicated to Husserl. He also uh, compiled a bibliography of Bolzano. And when he was, uh, when, when he spent his time in uh, uh, Göttingen, he got a recommendation uh, from Husserl, which was very positive. He formulated that uh, anybody has captured he, my, my uh, particular sympathies. In contrast, uh, in the Hungarian historiography of uh, philosophy, Anvar is mostly remembered as an unoriginal imitator. So uh, let's look uh, uh, quickly into the reasons uh, why Husserl could have uh, um, had such a good opinion of Anvar and having a good opinion of, of uh, his uh, students, students was uh, not typical of Husserl. So it's really a surprising fact. Um, so when Anvari arrived uh, to Göttingen, he already uh, brought with himself a deep historical background in Bolzano, the Prague School of Prentano. Here uh, you have a, a small uh, chart of the various uh, references he had to really uh, minor uh, second level figures. And uh, he was very interested in the phenology of meaning. Uh, by this is the reason he brought this uh, refutation of Palladius' critic. And then you have the historical fact that Husserl's discovery of the so-called so discovery of the noetical and noematical senses of meaning occurred or peaked around the years 1909-10. And furthermore, this went hand in hand, in hand with Husserl's re reading of Bolzano. So we have that somebody with this background in Bolzano and all this stuff arrived to Göttingen. We have no records of his conversations with Husserl, but when anybody leaves, Husserl, or around the time uh, anybody is in Göttingen, Husserl reaches a breakthrough in his thinking. You can really see it uh, uh, down to the level of the individual manuscript. And, uh, and that uh, this is somehow connected to a new reading of Bolzano by Husserl. And then it is, I think it is, uh, the question uh, arises whether Envari has had some uh, part or some contribution to this. So I'm not saying that it was Envari who discovered this uh, distinction, uh, especially, uh, but, but I, what I'm saying is that there was probably a close interaction between Husserl Anyvari and other persons, uh, and we must study these interactions. Uh, okay, so because I'm running short on time, uh, I try to uh, summarize my conclusions. So uh, uh, what I argue for first is a paradigm shift, so to speak, in evaluating the Central and Eastern European contribution to early phenomenology. Namely, instead of looking for creative but unconnected originality and devalue, devaluing uncreative reception, I propose that we should look for organic participation. That is, uh, the criteria should be first a level of non-trivial engagement with terminology and conceptual framework, and second, the embeddedness in contemporaneous actor networks. And we should do that even at the price if, if all figures like Envari uh, are not central in this network, but they were embedded in this network. And this is a positive thing. And we should, as historians of early phenomenology, we should take care of and, and we should write about that. And second, I argue for, uh, so to speak, the uh, sophisticated methodology, because I think in order um, for these contributions to be visible, 
we should really start employing a really sophisticated methodology, historiographical, history of writing methodology. For example, we should pay attention to philosophical constellations, that is, the dense and essentially intertwined connection of mutually interacting persons, ideas, theories, problems, and documents. This is something uh, scholars working on German idealism are aware of, but I think that also scholars working, historians uh, working on early phenology should pay more attention <coughs> to the special form of interaction and try to reconstruct them as far as possible. And then in turn, uh, we could say that this increased, increased methodological awareness is one potential lesson from writing the regional histories of phenomenology, a lesson we could teach or export to writing the history of universal history of phenomenology, so to speak. And finally, uh, just, uh, okay, an epilogue. Uh, so there are uh, other functions or uses of writing the regional history of phenomenology, which are not primarily philosophical maybe, uh, but uh, they cannot go unmentioned. Uh, first, at least I think so. First, uh, this uh, period uh, was really uh, uh, so many uh, Central and Eastern European participants in early phenology suffered during the tragedies of the 20th century and studying them is uh, at the same time giving voice to these uh, tragi tra uh, tragedies of history. Uh, and it must be mentioned that uh, at least in Hungary, uh, the historiography of them itself was affected by ideological considerations and we should try to undo them as far as possible. Second, um, it must be mentioned that uh, some of the, those uh, early phenomenologists him, himself or themselves were not as innocent as we uh, would have wished them uh, being. So, for example, you can see on the slides the marginal note uh, by Akos Pauler in his copy of uh, Edmund Husserl's Formale und Transcendentale Logik. And in, you can see it here. And in, in translation, you find uh, that uh, Pauler writes on the margin uh, that all this is self contradicting, uh, uh, see Augustine. And uh, then uh, he, he writes. Jewish over refinement that is essentially superficial. So it was maybe not uh, as bad as uh, Heidegger in his black notebooks, but uh, uh, this is also something we should remember. And in this sense, uh, we have, so to speak, a responsibility uh, when studying these thinkers. And uh, this responsibility, uh, a German uh, used to call this responsibility Vergangenheitsbewertigung, uh, coming to terms with, uh, with uh, our uh, own history, our own uh, past, and the tragic aspects of our past. And I simply uh, cannot, uh, uh, could, wasn't able to leave this uh, aspect unmentioned. So I hope I'm uh, within my time frame, and uh, thank you again for your attention. Okay, and uh, questions, comments, please. Yes, yes. Thank, you thank you very much for your paper. For your paper. To tell and the to truth, tell all these all things for me are new. new. And all these talks are also, also for me. In Russia, we... I don't know this don't know. And they are yeah. not popular, but we don't know about them at all so all this information was very interesting because it was at first very very new for me and i think for for many uh, who hear us so uh, perhaps uh, also a general question uh, for the beginning um, could you please uh, say what uh, the um, the main problems or the main interest are now in the um, phenomenology in uh, hungary I mean, what topics are popular, what topics are in mainstream of the phenological movement in Hungary? So what is um, the popular problems in the phenomenology uh, in Hungary? Uh, you mean uh, popular nowadays or popular? Yes, yes, nowadays. So I, I mean contemporary phenomenology. Yes, uh, so, uh, uh, yes, I, I think uh, there is one Hungarian phenologist uh, 
everybody knows or there was, namely Laszlo Tengeli. Uh, so he's really, uh, I mean, Wirt was, uh, until his tragic death, a world famous, uh, sorry, a world famous uh, phenomenologist and uh, who worked uh, in Hungary until uh, 2001 and then transferred to Germany. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the contemporary uh, interest in phenomenology in Hungary is very much uh, uh, influenced by his preferences at the time he left Hungary at the turn of the millennia. And that was, uh, that were uh, Husserl, Heidegger and the early French, so first wave of, of uh, post-war French phenomenology, living as Uh And then when he went uh, to Germany, he developed, uh, so to, it's very simplifying, but so then he developed his interest uh, in new French phenomenology, which is uh, slowly arriving in Hungary, but nowadays, uh, still uh, those his original preferences are still influential so but i mean it's 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 more or less obvious that when we have such a strong figure uh, in in contemporary uh, phenological thinking then uh, then then you can uh, guess what uh, what's happening in hungary and this is uh, probably this was the reason why i i, I decided to speak about uh, early reception of early phenomenology that is before the first world war and just uh, before i finish my answer i must uh, mention two other uh, mm, three maybe influential figures uh, nowadays uh, uh, besides uh, professor tengeli um, there are many of them so but actually uh, you have also professor balash mesai who is doing uh, uh, who did work on early phenomenology, the school of Brentano. He also translated Brentano into English, uh, together with Barry Smith. But uh, no, he's working on a, a phenomenology of religion or philosophy, speculative philosophy of religion, a very creative, original and interesting uh, uh, creative foray into phenomenology. Uh, then you should mention that there is a very uh, strong uh, school of uh, early Heidegger in Hungary, uh, which is somehow led by uh, Professor uh, Fehia, uh, focusing on really early Heidegger. It's very interesting hermeneutics as well, Gadamer and, and early Heidegger. Uh, and then, of course, you have uh, those late generation, uh, or not, so those uh, disciples of Lukács who somehow uh, appropriated uh, uh, phenomenology. Uh, for example, Professor Wider, who brought uh, to this special issue, uh, so that that maybe could give you some information uh, about uh, uh, contemporary Hungarian preferences uh, in phenomenology. I, I wonder whether this uh, was a kind of uh, reply or answer you were looking uh, for. Kira, Peter, thank you very much. So I, I understand that it is also a big question for another report, perhaps, uh, about the contemporary phenomenology in Hungary. So, but um, our um, next report will be devoted to uh, Tengeli, Professor Tengeli, and uh, I think it will be a good connection with your report. So to continue, so to say, Andrei Patkul, please, the next uh, paper. Uh, Peter, once again, thank you very much for your very interesting you. talk. So, uh, I'm very glad to meet you, even virtually, but, uh, so, and I'm so sorry for I do not use, for I do not use any presentation and images since I try to follow Plato, who said that the philosophers should know use uh, images in their reflections and explications, but I'm so sorry. Uh, and now in my talk, I'd like to tell a few words uh, about reflection of philosophy, of Laszlo Tengeli's philosophy, uh, basing on the contribution um, which belong to um, the issue of horizon studies and philology uh, presented today. 
So uh, we have uh, in common three contributions or three articles uh, in this issue dedicated to <clears throat> uh, Las Latengulis philosophy, uh, namely uh, the ones by Inge Römer, Eren Breuer, and uh, Benze Peter Maroshan. So before I go to the explications of uh, their, um, uh, their reception of uh, Tengeli's ideas, uh, I'd like to tell a few words about uh, Tengeli himself, uh, for, in particular for our Russian colleagues uh, who may uh, know him not enough well, not well enough, and um, Namely, uh, Professor Tengeli was um, first of all Hungarian and then German philosopher and professor of philosophy who was born in 1954 in Budapest and uh, passed away uh, suddenly in 2000. Um, 14 in Wuppertal and uh, in my opinion in my view he was uh, one of uh, uh, eminent of most uh, important phenologist and uh, since I deal also with uh, ontology with contemporary ontology I could tell that he was one of most eminent of important uh, ontologist of nowadays uh, so um, Notabene, <clears throat> uh, it could be of interest that Tengeli was also here in St. Petersburg and delivered uh, his uh, presentation, his report on uh, the notion of um, necessary of fact uh, in Aristotle and Husserl during the conference um, entitled uh, New Concept. Uh, new concepts in phenology in uh, 2010 here in St. Petersburg. So, and uh, it was a great expression for me to he hear him, to uh, and understand his uh, ideas, who, uh, which were very close to my own ideas, to my own um, approaches in uh, ontology today's ontology and phenological metaphysics. So now I'd like to turn back to uh, our contributions which belong to the issue uh, presented today. And uh, I like to say uh, in common about <clears throat> these articles, so the first article uh, by Inga Römer uh, entitled uh, in the following way from Kant to the problem of phenological metaphysics uh, in memory of Laszlo Tengeli. So uh, the contribution of uh, Römer, um, Römer's contribution is uh, elaborated, I would say, in so descriptional way he describes, oh, I'm so sorry, she, she describes um, in general um, the intellectual on life path of Laszlo Tengeli, but uh, she points also a few important questions uh, and concerns with uh, Tengeli's philosophy in common, in general. Since uh, she put the question of the possible so I would express it uh, in the following way. Um, she put the question of the um, possible unity of uh, Tengli thought, of uh, so co of results of outcomes outcomes of uh, Tengli thought of Tengli philosophy, which is a doubtful because he um, as said uh, passed away suddenly. And um, in the first part of uh, she's articles, she describes the path set uh, of uh, intellectual life uh, Tengelis. 
uh, which goes from historical historical philosoph philosophical studies uh, in um, particular of uh, German philosophy and uh, Kant's uh, transcendental philosophy, um, which goes to later studies in phenology, Tengli studies in phenology, and uh, then to um, to the elaboration of the project of the elaboration of Tengli's own uh, phenological metaphysics, phenological ontology in his uh, later works. And Tengel's later works. Uh, so um, the point uh, or the question is how the um, uh, metaphysics of uh, late Tengel's of late Tengel uh, derive from um, the, his uh, early, earlier uh, historical studies in German philosophy and uh, German idealism and uh, phenology. Uh, so uh, she explicates um, the possibility of understanding of uh, Tengel's uh, metaphysics on the base on the basis of uh, Tengel's studies uh, in history of in the history of philosophy. Uh, but uh, it in, in my view, in my opinion, it could uh, explicate also um, the reasons why uh, Tengli forms, uh, Tengli shapes his own meth uh, metaphysics, phenomenological metaphysics on, uh, in, in, on this way. But uh, I will uh, tell about this uh, moment, about this problem later in concern with uh, the article of Rene Breuer. And uh, one more interesting point of uh, Rumer's uh, article, uh, in my view, is, is in his dealing with um, uh, Tengli's uh, conversation with today realism in um, presented, uh, for example, by Alain from French philosophers, uh, for example. Uh, Alain Badiou and uh, Canton Mesu. Uh, she uh, reconstructs the uh, argumentation which uh, Tengeli gives to uh, gave to uh, the uh, Mayasu and uh, Mayasus and Badiou's uh, attacks on, on uh, the possibility of uh, phenological of uh, possibility of phenological metaphysics and uh, transcendental metaphysics as such. So uh, it is uh, from from my point of view so uh, very important, very intelligent, and um, good elaborated. Uh, controversy between uh, transcendental uh, today's uh, transcendental philosophy which uh, presented uh, which is presented by Tengeli and today uh, today's realism in the second um, contribution uh, in the uh, first issue of this volume of horizon um, this is an uh, article of Irene Breuer, uh, which is elaborated in German and entitled Fakticität uh, Notwendigkeit und Zufälligkeit bei Aristoteles und Husserl. That's Facticity, Necessary and uh, Contingency in Aristotle and Husserl. So, uh, this is perhaps uh, this is in my own uh, view, my own opinion, uh, private opinion. But I think that is the main uh, the the um, correlations. I would, I would like correlation between uh, facticity and necess uh, um, necessary being uh, in uh, Tengeli. This is the um, main. Uh, subject main theme in his philosophical his metaphysical uh, thought so uh, uh, Tengeli analyzes uh, 
uh, the notion of uh, the, the mentioned notion uh, in two important philosophers in hist history of philosophy, namely in Aristotle and Husserl, and uh, on the basis of this uh, analysis, he planned to elaborate, uh, and partly he done uh, this, uh, his own uh, metaphysics of uh, phenomenological metaphysics of world project. So, uh, what is the problem uh, in this regard? Uh, this is, it depends on uh, traditional um, opinion, traditional uh, doctrine that a necessary being is uh, always uh, a, a general being. So uh, Tengeli turns to Aristotelian distinction between um, between uh, I, I would uh, like to tra translate uh, Greek and German term on, to on, and, and uh, design the, as that which is, in my, in my view, this is the most adequate uh, version of uh, this uh, Greeks, uh, Greek and German term. Uh, uh, so I will use uh, this version of the translation in the following. So, uh, I, I, as uh, it is a very well known, Aristotle uh, divides um, various meaning of being, of that which is, and being of, in the sense of that which is. And there are uh, two meanings uh, who, uh, which are mentioned by Tengeli in his philosophy, in his metaphysics, and uh, namely, th th these are. Uh, first of all, uh, that which is in general uh, on Katholu, uh, and uh, that which uh, is uh, as God, uh, as, as God is um, on Theon, in Aristotle's own words. So uh, if we um, uh, if you would think uh, about this, this distinction, about this uh, differentiation uh, in Aristotle, we could uh, understand that uh, for Aristotle, uh, the necessary character, uh, only um, the being, uh, only that which is uh, as a common uh, one, as Katholu, uh, can only have a necessary character. Uh, but uh, the singular beings, uh, particular being, beings, particular, particular single that which is, cannot uh, have um, uh, necessary character. They are um, contingent in principle, in their principle. So, uh, but uh, what does Aristotle mean here? Uh, I think he he think about uh, that um, only uh, essential being or only essence could could be of uh, necessary, and uh, singular individual being could be only factual, and then uh, they could be uh, or it could be um, only. Uh, Contingent. So um, the question arises uh, whether the uh, being of God uh, could be also uh, only uh, contingent, or would be only uh, um, accidental, so to say. Now, we know that uh, God, as such, uh, is not uh, essence uh, in common, uh, is not essence in general. God is uh, an individual being. But we could not say, even in Aristotle's view, that uh, God is uh, contingent. God, as actual being, in Aristotle's view, uh, have to be already for all the possibilities, uh, could be also, could also exist. Then the actuality of God in Aristotle's view uh, should be present before any um, essential being, before uh, any 
that which is in the sense of uh, common being. So, thus, uh, the, the being of God uh, could not be accidental. Uh, it could not be uh, contingent in the, uh, on the way. Um, and this is a uh, paradoxal uh, thesis. Uh, uh, God is an indiv individual being which, uh, have, uh, which uh, should have uh, necessary character is uh, individual uh, being individual uh, that which is could uh, have uh, the character of necessity. So this is a problem. But uh, Tengeli finds that uh, the similar similar problem uh, uh, is in the Husserl's thought, because Husserl Husserl presuppose uh, also um, some. Uh, individual uh, beings, uh, some individual that which is in his, in his philosophy, which uh, have, uh, which have uh, the character of necessity. So, uh, and uh, Irena Breuer um, tell about, uh, tells about uh, this uh, moments and hustles, uh, thought uh, by the construction of uh, Lassel Tengel's interpretations of uh, Hassel's metaphysics. Namely, uh, there are four things uh, what, uh, which, um, which have a uh, character of necessity in Husserlian philosophy according to Lassel Tengel's reconstructions of uh, Hassel's philosophy. Namely, uh, First of all, this is a, a transcendental ego. This is an individual being, but uh, in thinking in phenological way, we can, cannot tell that, uh, we cannot imagine, so to say, any situation in which uh, transcendental ego could not exist at all. This is a paradoxical uh, state, but, uh, statement, but uh, even so. Uh, the second one, on the other hand, uh, uh, the character of necessity has, uh, no, I'm so sorry, uh, the, the world in the phenological interpretation, uh, the, the world in phenological understanding also has a character of necessity in Husserian view, but um, uh, this is, uh, uh, in, in my view, this is uh, more difficult to explain uh, this statement of uh, Hassel and Tengeli, but uh, this is of, important that, of importance that uh, one, one treat uh, the world uh, also as, uh, in phenological sense, the world uh, as a um, necessity uh, being, the, oh yeah, yes, as necessity, uh, necessary uh, being. So uh, the problem is in the proper, uh, in the own uh, character of this necessity uh, in accordance uh, to Tengeli and Hussel because the uh, individual events, the individual beings uh, inside the world are contingent, but world as such, world as a totality of phenomena uh, is in, uh, in, in a sense um, of necessity. So uh, the third uh, thing uh, which um, are phenomenologically uh, necessary uh, e is the phenomenon of the others, of the other persons, of the other uh, people who are also um, uh, necessary in um, transcendental sense, not in empirical sense, that uh, we, can, uh, we can see from Hussle's uh, Cartesian meditations. So, and uh, the last point uh, which uh, em emphasizes Breuer <coughs> is uh, uh, histori historicity in the sense of Geschichtlichkeit. Uh, 
uh, this is uh, also very strange because uh, historicity, history at all, uh, always was uh, the things uh, which um, could not of could not be of necessity, could, could not not be necessary. But uh, the history uh, in this is in the sense the history historicity is uh, mm, I would like to tell in this way. Uh, uh, necessary moment, uh, necessary aspect of uh, transcendental life, of uh, transcendental ego itself. So, uh, and on the basis of the reconstruction of Aristotle's and Hussle's uh, views on, um, uh, on the correlation of uh, facticity and uh, necessary being and contingency, uh, Tengeli um, tries to uh, build his own metaphysics, uh, which uh, characterized by him as uh, metaphysics of uh, world projects. Of world projects, uh, Tengeli. Um, interprets um, or treats uh, the metaphysics as uh, in the Greek world uh, to agon of world projects, which are of uh, which which have a uh, character of uh, factual necessity in the sense. So, and uh, finally, I'd like to tell uh, something about uh, Ben Sir Peter Marashan's uh, article and uh, Marashan um, uh, tells about uh, more uh, precise point of um, Lassel Tengel's metaphysics, namely uh, he uh, deals with uh, Tengli's anthropology. Anthropology. So the main uh, notion, the main concept of uh, Tengli's anthropology, and so far I know I could uh, know it from uh, Marasan's article, uh, and from my point of view too. Uh, this is a notion of life history. And uh, it uh, depends also uh, depends also on um, Tengeli's reinterpretation. Uh, I would so say reinterpretation of the uh, common phenological, and uh, not only phenological but idealistic also um, notion of event, arrivals uh, or geschehen, in a sense. So, uh, Baroshan uh, emphasizes this notion and uh, he thinks that this is the uh, center of the um, uh, Lasso Tengel's metaphysics, uh, which has, uh, which uh, connected to uh, Tengel's phenological or transcendental ontology and uh, this anthropology in uh, Maroshan's and my own view. Uh, has a very uh, is a very perspective, and I think it was a great project to be uh, continued to be developed in a way. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Andre, uh, for this presentation. One of the parts of our issue, a special issue devoted to Laszlo Tengeli. Perhaps some questions or remarks from participants. or perhaps later we have uh, two more reports and then we can at the end of our presentation so to say in conclusion to put all questions that we have so thank you andre once again and i would like to give uh, the floor to fyodor stanjevsky so please Fyodor. Uh, well um uh, my name is fyodor stanjevsky i uh, I'm teaching at the Technological Institute, uh, Saint Petersburg. So I was asked just to make uh, to prepare a, a very brief report, and so I did. Uh, so uh, uh, I would like to speak about a, a figure much less central for phenomenology uh, than those presented before. Uh, well, the personality um, <clears throat> uh, I would like to speak about is Josef Tischner. 
a Polish priest and a phenomenologist. Uh, well, uh, there are several reasons for which I chose this personality. Well, first, uh, although uh, Tisner's philosophy is not part of my philosophical interests, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I personally attended his lectures and uh, it's kind of a tribute to this personality whom I respect greatly. Really. Uh, secondly, uh, Tishner, well, in the second period of his thought, Tishner tended to depart from theoretical philosophy to, uh, the, uh, to a vision of philosophy as responding to some concrete expectations of people, existential expectations. He was a priest, it was quite uh, understandable. Uh, and uh, I suppose that this tendency on his part is uh, quite in line with the global tendency of philosophy, with the so-called practical turn in philosophy. Uh, where when a practical philosophy is no more considered to be inferior or uh, um, secondary to the theoretical philosophy. Uh, so this is the second reason. Well, um, <clears throat> thirdly, uh, well, uh, uh, considerations in uh, social ontology, joint, ac joint uh, activity, joint attention, and collectivity in general, are uh, more and more coming to the foreground in philosophy now, in analytical philosophy, first of all. Uh, well, just to mention such names as uh, Searle or uh, Margaret Gilbert or, and so on and so on. Uh, Raimo Tormela, of course, in Finland. And I personally participate, uh, I participated in a, in a workshop, uh, in a Russian-Finnish uh, workshop devoted to the social ontology, uh, directed, uh, also by uh, Raimo Tormela, a Finnish philosopher. And I'd like to, uh, s mm, how to say, um, uh, I'd like to say that even if these studies, analytical studies and scientific studies and cognitive studies are very, very fruitful in their own way, are uh, very interesting, nevertheless, I should, uh, I would like the, uh, to stress that we should keep in mind another possibility of philosophy. Uh, personally, excuse me, I, uh, j just to quote uh, uh, Pope John Paul II, well, uh, who said that the, the, the church has two lungs. Well, I'm persuaded that philosophy has two lungs. One of them is uh, English-speaking philosophy and uh, the other is, uh, well, philosophy of, of phenomenological, uh, say, direction, or line. Okay. Uh, uh, so this is uh, the third reason for which I would like to speak about Titian. I think that the, his metaphysical or more um, poetical, if you want, uh, literary philosophy is also what we need. So we should keep in mind both perspectives, uh, both scientific philosophy and more literary philosophy, more let's say, poetic philosophy. Uh, well, um, uh, Tischner, uh, well, Tischner was a priest. Uh, it is a very striking personality. Uh, well, he was a chaplain, a non-official chaplain of, of the Solidarity Movement. And he, his sermons were widely uh, read and, uh, and even published, very, very popular. So he, he had the, the, the courage to oppose the uh, communist authorities. But also after the victory of democracy in Poland, he, uh, he had the same courage to oppose sometimes the church now in full power and in full authority. And he uh, remained loyal to many persons who were ostracized, uh, ostracized by, by the official church. So it, it was a very courageous man. It was uh, uh, not only a specialist in philosophy, uh, first of all in phenomenology, but he, it was an, also a philosopher uh, a la manière <laughs> the, uh, in the, uh, of, uh, of um, Mark Aurelius, who lived his philosophy. Um, okay, um, so Tishner, uh, Tishner's philosophy uh, can be divided into two periods. During the first period, he was a phenomenologist, a strict phenomenologist. He wrote his uh, thesis uh, under in Garden's guidance, and his thesis was devoted to the one of the central problems in phenomenology, the, the problem of transcendental ego in Husserl. Uh, and uh, then 
uh, he also had the courage to defend Husserl against Ingarden, because uh, you know Ingarden uh, reproached uh, Husserl for uh, departing from uh, realism, and uh, 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 and Tischner wanted to show that somehow uh, Ingarden misinterpreted Husserl and was uh, did not do justice to Husserl. Okay. Um, uh, uh, then uh, he uh, devoted his, um, uh, well, his philosophical interest to uh, the uh, axiological problems and uh, to, to a theory of values, uh, most probably under the influence of Max Scheller. But uh, uh, at, at the, uh, well, uh, at, in the beginning of his second period, he uh, came to, um, to review his philosophical interests. He, he came to, uh, to get interested in uh, more practical problems. And uh, when asked about the, uh, the way of, of, of existence of values, he tended to answer, I have a quotation. Well, now I'm no more interested in the way of existence of values. For me, what, what matters for me is the way I exist face to values. Uh, the way I realize values, and so on. And uh, he said that we cannot ontologize everything. Uh, so he came to see ontology as somehow secondary to metaphysics. Metaphysics, uh, again, à la manière de Levinas. Uh, and here the influence of Levinas is uh, absolutely uh, obvious. And, uh, well, uh, now, uh, it is the category of drama that comes to the foreground of his, uh, his thought, instead of values, instead of the ontology of values. Okay, uh, the category of drama. Uh, well, uh, I, um, perhaps uh, uh, now I would rather let him speak for himself, uh, just uh, to, uh, to, to quote some fragments of his uh, phenomenology of encounter. Uh, um, an essay which marked uh, his uh, a turning point at his philosophy. So uh, from now uh, on, I, I'll be just quoting uh, Tishner, okay? Don't mind. Uh, well, to, to encounter somebody is to be face to face. Well, uh, I'm, I'm translating from Polish life, so excuse me for the lack of uh, fluency or, or mistakes, okay? Uh, uh, thanks to uh, encounters, we achieve some appearance of, 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 the, of, of the face of another person. So what is the, the faith? What is, excuse me, what is faith? Sorry, after 16 uh, lectures and seminars a week, uh, my head is a little bit, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, um, um, uh, okay, so uh, he, uh, uh, distinguishes between face and mask and screen. Well, but, uh, just no, to, to, to put a long story brief, okay? The, uh, uh, the mystery of encounter, okay, 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 mm, sorry. Mm -hmm. no. uh, we cannot say what face is, because face is just uh, some impalpable sp splendor of light in which uh, the others being uh, uh, is for us. Okay, it's very poetical. It's not. Uh, it's not strict. But I think that this perspective is uh, really what we need to. We cannot just uh, restrain ourselves to the uh, achievements of positive sciences or uh, uh, or some uh, analysis. Okay, so the other is uh, in in an encounter. The other persuades as no object does, the other persuades. And you know, it's, uh, I, um, uh, I recently I ran across a fragment of Adam Smith, who is a, an outstanding Scot Sc Scottish philosopher and, and economist. And can you imagine, he speaks in the same line. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have, uh, I don't have the, the quotation at hand, but uh, I, uh, I assure you, that you can uh, um, you can catch some 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 of uh, some of this uh, sh shade of meaning in his in his uh, thought. Okay, just believe me. Uh, so uh, 
Well, uh, I want to be brief because I have a long quotation. I just, uh, I'm going to, um, to end by, uh, uh, with, the, with the following quotation. To encounter another person is, uh, to, by the same token, to encounter uh, myself from, from, from an aspect that I did not, did not know before. Okay. I think it's very important and it's, it's very important to keep this uh, freshness and uh, openness of, of, of literary philosopher. Tishner, for example, does not hesitate to quote Tolstoy or, to, or Flaubert. Uh, okay, speaking about an, uh, an encounter between people, uh, he, uh, for, for example, he cites the, the he calls the, uh, the scene between, uh, the silent scene between Kitty and Levin in Anna Karenina. I, I think everybody knows the scene, uh, uh, which I mean, okay. Uh, all right, uh, all right, uh, all right. Uh, um, uh, well, this is really the, Final quotation, okay? Here we go. Uh, so uh, we, have, uh, we have discovered uh, two more categories, freedom and truth. The other is free. The other is uh, a carrier of some truth. Everything uh, uh, and all these aspects uh, play a very important uh, uh, role in my experience of the face of the other. Okay. So, uh, the other's face is some freedom and some uh, truth which lives in the splendor of good and uh, in the darkness of uh, evil. <laughs> All right, uh, I, I end here. Thank you, Fyodor, for this very literally poetic and very expressive talk. <laughs> So perhaps some questions from uh, from you, or uh, I mean, we told Peter, and from other participants as well. If uh, uh, do you hear me? Yeah, yes, we hear you. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I'm very curious uh, because, as far as I know, uh, Tishner's uh, works are translated into English and German as well. And I'm very curious uh, whether, is there any reception of Tishner in Russia? Well, unfortunately, well, this is the fourth reason for which I checked Tishner. Uh, exactly. Uh, it, it didn't mention it. Uh, uh, Tishner is a philosophical personality who is very little known in Russia, unfortunately, because I, I think that he is very noteworthy. He is worthy of interest, really. Uh, I think that uh, uh, his philosophy cannot be interpreted as just one, uh, 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 so to, how, how to say, one version of Levinas. It's something more. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Some remarks, perhaps? How to combine two ways <laughs> in the philosophy of thought? So, a good idea. Okay, thank you, uh, Fyodor, once again. And we go to the last uh, um, report, to the last talk uh, during our presentation. Svetlana Nikonova, please, it will be the talk about the phenological aesthetics. Okay, dear colleagues, and I have a presentation. I want to have it. Uh, so, uh, my theme, as you see, is a little, a little bit marginal to our discussion, for it uh, does not exactly concern uh, the phenomenology in Eastern Europe, but um, one topic in the issue of Chorazin was very interesting for me, and um, it, concern, it concerned aesthetics. For I'm, I specialize not in phenomenology, but in aesthetics, and that's why I was interested in this thing. For uh, last issue of the journal has a section uh, which is called Phenomenology and Aesthetics. And um, aesthetic problem uh, is uh, represented in this section, but also, which is very interesting, it is represented in the uh, in the translations for um, the part of the translation, uh, translations, it has two texts, 
and uh, both texts are aesthetical. And so um, we could ask, uh, is it a mere coincidence or maybe we can find here a sign of deeper interrelation of phenomenology and aesthetics? And so, yes, uh, the second slide. Um, here you can see uh, the list of the articles and devoted to aesthetic, pro aesthetic problems in the issue. And to make it convenient for Russian-speaking auditor and English-speaking, uh, I present them both in, in both languages. And uh, so I shall do with um, the main uh, statement, statements of my report. Uh, so, uh, yes, we can, if you, <laughs> I think you see all these um, yeah, articles, and uh, so uh, we shall go further. Uh, so, phenomenology and aesthetics. Um, this conjunction seems to be ambiguous, for on one hand we understand that we can look at aesthetics from the point of view of phenomenology, give phenomenological interpretation of aesthetic problems, which are the problems relating some special kind of experience named aesthetic, and also such human practice as art. And that is what is actually done in articles we find in the issue. On the other hand, we can look at phenomenology from the point of view of aesthetics and explore what phenomenological interpretation could give us for understanding of aesthetic problem and notions in general. And this is what we're going to do, to look at phenomenology from the point of view of aesthetics and try to find the place of phenomenology in aesthetic context. Uh, so once more, uh, so once more, uh, I'd um, like to ask: Is it a coincidence that uh, the translations which we see in this uh, issue of from Maurice Geiger and uh, from uh, Mark Rishir uh, are uh, concerning aesthetics? Uh, the ideas of Moritz Geiger, the philosopher of the beginning of 20th century, seem at first to be accident to his conception, although he is uh, considered to initiate development of phenomenological aesthetics or phenomenological approach to aesthetics. Uh, but uh, as, we come, as we come to Rishir, our contemporary, though unfortunately two days ago, uh, it was a year from his death. It's, uh, it's uh, such an day uh, we have. Uh, so uh, as we come to Rishir, uh, we see that the, um, these aesthetic ideas are central to his conception, uh, which should rather be called some kind of aesthetically char charged phenomenology. Uh, he starts uh, from interpretation of Husserl's uh, notion of fantasy, which in Rashir becomes basical for understanding of phenomenology. So we can see the development of phenomenology in direction where the importance of aesthetic interpretation of phenomenological method increases. Aesthetic experience becomes uh, maybe the most fertile ground for understanding this method. And this comes already from Kant's definitions of aesthetic judgment uh, which he formulated at the very beginning of the development of aesthetics as philosophical discipline. So it's also not surprising that text of uh, text by Moritz Geiger uh, is devoted to problem raised by Kant. Uh, first, it seems he argues with Kant, uh, but then we understand that it's rather an attempt to clarify Kant's thought, uh, to protect it from criticism, uh, caused by a misunderstanding of terminology. But we'll return to this theme later. And so uh, let us briefly characterize the main ideas of the text in their relation to aesthetics and try to reveal general phenomenological understanding of aesthetic problem. Uh, so yes, uh, see, here is the next slide. So, uh, so uh, Yaroslava Vidrova. Uh, in the first um, article in uh, this section, Phenomenology and Aesthetics, tells us about intertwining of conceptual basis and uh, world comprehension of phenomenology and such artistic modernist practice as Cubism. In general, this thought isn't something new. 
Uh, both movements arise at the same period and characterize, characterize one and the same turn in the history of modernist thought. Vitrova considers theory and practice of Czech phenomenology and cubism, for the latter was one of the most important cubist schools. But we can look at it in a wider context of modernist art. For example, um, Artega Gasset, in his famous The Dogmanization of Art, says that for all artistic directions of the time, phenomenological vision and liberation of art from everything which is human is characteristic. It's also expressed in conceptual statements uh, of Picasso, um, now who states um, art um, turns from recognizable objects to primary forms, from representation to construction. Um, though Vidro finds here some traits of voluntarism and manipulation, she also acknowledges that the dominant idea is quite the opposite. Uh, we could find it also in the statements of uh, art critic Ernst Gombrich, uh, who says, modernist artists uh, turn from representation of the human to the solution of pure artistic problem, different from psychological involvement in the picture of, of reality. Yeah. So we can uh, move to the next slide. Um, and so, what is the main idea of uh, the article? Uh, Vidro finds it in something which could be described, described as she tells in Husserl's term, as an interested observer. This act is close to phenomenological, uh, though reduction, uh, through, um, excuse me, through reduction to pure forms and turn to autonomous image, cubism reveals the space of, of phenomenological pure experience. And uh, also you can see here a fragment of the picture of a Czech cubist, Emil Filla, uh, named the artist. So, uh, so they represent here the artist as autonomous image. Uh, so uh, the next slide. Uh, the article by Jan Josu considers at first quite another problem, the problem of the end of art. He argues with Hegel and Arthur Dante uh, and insists that from the point of view of phenomenology, this problem can be easily overcome, the problem of the end of art. Uh, though maybe Hegel's and Dante's positions are rather simplified here in this uh, article, but the main goal is to demonstrate that phenomenological approach to art moves quite another direction than theirs do. Uh, theirs, uh, that means Hegel's and Arthur Dantos. Um, and um, phenomenology looks at art from completely other point of view. It's demonstrated on the example of aesthetics of Jan Patichka. Uh, who considers art in relation, uh, as uh, it is quoted in the article, to phenomenological conception of truth conceived as alete. Um, as the uh, author insists, uh, Patechka interprets the art as human practice that allows being, being manifest itself, being manifest itself in art. And also he insists uh, that it manifests itself, manifests itself historically from definite conditions of life and definite epoch, uh, even if it is technical epoch. And that's why even contemporary experiments, um, though they do not express some objective appearance of things and not reveal truth of the subject as in Hegel, or um, do not make exact copies of things, nevertheless deal with the truth of epoch in some very special act. And so what this act? A specific trait of art which allows it to reveal the truth conceived as aletheia uh, is its ability to disinterested uh, observer, uh, once again disinterested observer. 
And uh, once again, this act eliminates the involvement in the human context as Ortega y Gasset taught. Uh, and as such practice, uh, for Padochka, art becomes liberating and free in practice. So, the next slide. And uh, here we can notice interesting facts. Uh, here we can notice interesting fact, this phenomenological idea is standing apart from interpretation of art as a step in uh, the history of subjective vision, as in uh, Hegel's philosophy of art, uh, where it actually comes to its end, and we can see this end in some uh, such artifacts as, for example, um, something like uh, Black Square, um, and so, um, uh, this phenomenological idea, which stands apart um, this Hegel's interpretation, coincides with one else interpretation, which is um, which uh, isn't often mentioned in phenomenological context. Uh, this is understanding of art by Arthur Schopenhauer. Uh, whose interpretation is also not consistent to common philosophical view on art as specific uh, creative activity of human subjectivity, uh, which was expressed by Hegel. Uh, Schopenhauer also sees in art something liberating from tyranny of the will. Uh, and it's important that Schopenhauer uh, based that idea on Kant's conception of aesthetic disinterestedness. Once again, aesthetic disinterestedness. Uh, phenomenology turns the same idea into the foundation of uh, its method, um, not uh, meaning aesthetics, not mentioning aesthetics at all, and then returns to interpretation of aesthetics again from this uh, idea turned into method. So now we'll come to the translations and uh, the next slide. Um, the first text is one by Moritz Geiger. Uh, its goal, as we already told, is to overcome terminological ambiguity in Kant. Uh, and the ambiguous notion is this very notion we mentioned above, the notion of aesthetic uh, disinterestedness. Uh, he makes it by distinguishing the notion of interested and disinterested interest. He notes that uh, aesthetic judgment uh, is made on the ground of intensive experience, uh, which can't be called the lack of interest. Uh, but at the same time, uh, being, uh, being very intensive, at the same time, it's free from interest to any external reasons or relations in which the object of aesthetic judgment is involved. And so our thesis are. Uh, the concept of uh, aesthetic judgment in Kant's system is purest manifestation of critical act in self. And so here it becomes uh, actually some kind of phenomenological act. So maybe the next slide we need. Um, phenomenological understanding, understanding of art is revealing the truth of being. Is um, uh, phenomenological understanding of art as revealing the truth of being uh, is closely linked with Kant's idea of aesthetic disinterestedness. And it also gives us possibility to analyze the increasing importance of art and aesthetics uh, in contemporary philosophical th thought. Uh, aesthetic disinterestedness uh, doesn't exclude intensity of experience. Uh, the same as intensity accompanies the experience of re revealing of truth conceived as aletheia. And so on we move to Mark Rishir. So, uh, the next slide. Uh, Mark Rishir analyzes Husserl's concept of fantasy. Uh, first of all, he separates it from concept of imagination. Uh, we can say so. Um, imagination tries to uh, give reality to its objects drives them into context of existence. So imagination uh, makes uh, its object to exist. Uh, 
Uh, but fantasy, as Rishir uh, says, fantasizes uh, the absent as the absent. And so in act of fantasy, the subject disappears, for intentional position disappears too. Fantasy for Rishir is a pre-intentional act. It's establishing another reality, which is different to one subjectively perceived. It has another form of temporality. So the next slide. Uh, we can see uh, Rashid's interpretation and even his examples uh, are rather close in this uh, fragment, which is published in Horizon. Um, his examples are rather close to existentialist interpretation Sartre once gave to imagination. But um, the latter interpreted imagination negatively as elimination of reality by its aesthetic act. And so he saves relation between the imaginary and real. Uh, Richard claims on the reality of absence, transforming the external world of perception, so our uh, common reality, uh, into fantastic nothing. Uh, and he characterizes this trait of fantasy as Kantian sublime. Uh, aesthetic perception of something endless and unformed, very close to uh, perception of um, nothingness. Uh, so, so uh, maybe uh, maybe we tried to accent too strong one side of Richard's idea. But it's interesting that it coincides with some post-structuralist concepts. Uh, for example, Derrida, Deleuze, Deman. Uh, Derrida's difference uh, sets positive sense to a gap, to absence. And um, using Deleuze's terms, it gives birth to multiplicity of senses in their variety which is opposite to negative sense of the difference with the letter E. Uh, difference uh, as, uh, is um, just a negative instance and um, uh, as a negative instance, it is like non-being, uh, which is uh, according to Parmenides, non-thinkable. And so we can suggest that post-structuralist conceptions also based on phenomenology. And they move the same direction as phenomenology itself, as we see in Rashir. Uh, though they go in quite other terms and solving quite uh, other problems. Uh, phenomenological act affirm an uh, illusory uh, character of the world, at the same time is able to make it positive. And make illusion positive. Um, and positive in the sense of density, intensity, and presence. Uh, it's once again is what Picasso tried to find. Eliminating visible forms. And uh, visible forms are visible phenomenal. And um, that's uh, why they are illusory. As phenomenal, they are illusory. So eliminating visible forms, uh, we could return to intensive experience in new world of fantasy as new mythical reality. And uh, that could withdraw us from subjectivist track uh, of virtuality, uh, virtuality and uh, derealization, 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 um, and total aesthetization by developing aesthetization itself, like means of conceiving the truth uh, as Aletea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Svetlana. Uh, perhaps some questions to this talk and some remarks. Yes, please. Um, Alexey Krukov. Uh, Sv Svetlana, uh, thank you very much for your interesting talk with a lot of interesting topics you have discussed here. And I would like to return to one thesis of you. You mean um, that um, there is a similarity between phenological methods and art in respect of frying from object. Uh, 
as far as I'm concerned from your report, and you have argued with uh, example of uh, cubism. Uh, my question is, uh, in some respect, I agree with you because uh, Husserl and his uh, and the researcher in film, uh, researchers in the phenomenology are trying to find the simplest forms in thinking, and in some respect, we can uh, compare art and phenomenology here. But if I take this your argument and use it, for example, for Descartes' philosophy. Uh, it is true too, and my question is, uh, what is especially phenomenological uh, here in this method of uh, trying to compare art and uh, phenomenology? Could you uh, uh, say shortly and clear? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, this um, uh, uh, this is uh, about. Um, intertwining of uh, cubism and phenomenology was uh, t taken from the article by Yaroslav Vidrova. And uh, I uh, found that it is very similar to what um, was said in, by the cubists themselves, the French cubists and uh, many other uh, thinkers of that time. And um, of course, uh, there is um, always coincidence between art and philosophy of the epoch. But uh, phenomenologists, uh, phenomenologists, um, and Vidrova uh, shows it. Uh, they, uh, in their statements, in their statements, they. Um, uh, Say are uh, something um, something very. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, in the statements, they coincide with uh, the. Um, <laughs> with uh, with uh, the main idea of the cubists. Um, tried to express and they uh, also told about it and uh, we um, see it in this um, in this uh, work by Ortega Gasset uh, which uh, described all the modernist epoch so uh, if Descartes and the art of his epoch are uh, coinciding they uh, express one mood one uh, uh, one <laughs> one comprehension of the world and uh, we can find one and the same comprehension of the world between modernist artists uh, of the beginning of 20th century and uh, uh, philosophers of uh, the same time and uh, phenomenological method is close to cubist in what? And that is what uh, was the main thesis of Vidrava, and that is what is the main thesis of all uh, my article, is uh, all, all my report in whole. This is what is uh, taken from Kant's aesthetics. Uh, this is aesthetic disinterestedness. That disinterestedness is coinciding with phenomenological method, which um, um, takes uh, the object from the human involvement in the psychological context, in cultural context, in uh, all contexts to um, which we should reduce to make the phenomenological procedure. And that's uh, what uh, also we find in cubism and in statements of cubist artists and all modernist artists uh, in general, as Ortega Gasset uh, told us. Thank you. One more question, perhaps. So, then thank you very much, Svetlana. And uh, so our presentation is coming to the end, and I would like to ask uh, somebody in the auditorium, the participants, perhaps to make some remarks uh, on all reports at all, not exactly on the last. So, please. Uh, if I may, I would make a small remark, just uh, the presentation of Professor Patkul, and he introduced for Russian colleagues, uh, Professor Laszlo Tengeli, and I just 
such a small remark. I think it's um, a little bit not fair by introducing Professor Tengel and not saying, uh, like introduce him like a, a big philosopher. It's true, but he was also a very important professor and teacher, uh, especially when we speak about phenomenology in Eastern Europe and worldwide, uh, Professor Tengeli um, brought so many international PhD researchers, young researchers in phenomenology and philosophy to Wuppertal. And maybe if not a school, but he made us like live being circle of young researchers. And he played a very important role also for Russian uh, young researchers in phenomenology and for researchers from Latin America, for uh, Eastern Europe and worldwide. So I just wanted to make the small remark that he was not only a uh, very well known and important uh, phenomenologist, but also a teacher who um, create maybe even a new wave in studying uh, phenomenology in Germany, but not by not only by German students, but by international students. And as a professor of the program, um, German and French uh, phenomenology, like Erasmus Mundus, Euro Philosophy in Deutschland and Frankreich, as a professor of this program, he also uh, played well part, an important part of um, bringing the phenological impulse in uh, Eastern Europe and worldwide. So, just Thank you, Dasha, for this remark. And one more, perhaps. Okay, uh, then I would like to thank once again Vitold and Peter that you were with us during these two hours, more than two hours together. And there uh, are um, I am very much looking forward to continue our cooperation in the future. And so we see that there are so many questions and problems uh, which are to discuss in the future, so a big potential of the phenomenology. And there, um, I think that, so I very, I'm very, ho I very hope that this uh, third conference uh, next summer in Riga uh, will be held and we will have the opportunity to discuss the uh, phenological issues further. And um, we told, do you remember in Gdansk, we've got an idea to devote perhaps this third conference to the phenological aesthetics. Yes, that was our idea also. And now listening to the last report, uh, I thought that uh, that was perhaps a very good uh, decision uh, to devote some of the uh, further conferences uh, to the, this topic, so to the phenology and the aesthetics or phenological aesthetics. Because I don't know how it is in Poland or in Hungary, but in Russia, uh, this topic is uh, absolutely not discovered, so very poor discovered. And uh, so for me, it will be very interesting to participate in such kind of conference devoted to this topic. So we see that we have uh, many work <laughs> in the future, so many problems and many um, uh, issues to discover. And so thank you once again, Peter. Thank you once again, we told, for um, your collaboration with us, for your participating in this presentation. And I would like to thank also everybody who come today uh, in our very cold winter evening. So, uh, so these people are very brave, I should say. <laughs> and uh, so I also would like to, to thank those who uh, was with us uh, during our online presentation. So who was online with us on the YouTube channel. And uh, so the last uh, remark, so the video is being recorded and uh, so uh, will be uploaded on the YouTube channel and I will put uh, it, uh, uh, so this, uh, this video I will put in our site, our website or our journal and of course I write you uh, especially email when it will be done, yes, and I'll send you this um, this link to our video uh, and uh, uh, we can uh, spread this link to other authors of this special issue uh, so they will have the opportunity to, to see this presentation and to listen to all these reports we've made here. 
So thank you once again for everybody, Peter, you told. <laughs> I was very glad to see you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.